Hi and welcome to another episode of Page One, the Writer's Podcast. I'm Marco. I'm Tarek. And thanks for joining us for this very special episode. If you, if this is the first time you're watching Page One, uh, out on the podcast we like to speak to writers of all kinds about their writing journeys, find out how they got into the industry and try and get as many hints and tips from them as possible. Um, on this episode though, it's a very special episode because we've got not one but two guests today. Uh, first of all, we're speaking with uh, Corey Doctorow who's written I don't know, about a million books. At least maybe. a million books. Uh, uh, fiction and non-fiction. He's worked for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. He campaigns hard on issues like copyright. Uh, and he's written a really important book, I think, in terms of uh, creators with uh, Rebecca Giblin. Yeah. Rebecca is a uh, professor at Melbourne Law School, and she leads teams at research issues such as Creators' Rights, Access to Knowledge, the Regulation of Technology, um, and the culture and and she kind of comes at this book from a scholarly point of view you know she brings her experience in that in the academic side of things and Corey kind of brings his experience of writing books factual fiction books and it's a really good mesh I think the two of them make a really good pair yeah and it's a really interesting chat about issues that are so important to creators these yeah. days uh, you know so many creators rights are now bound up in you know very monopolistic companies across different parts of the art sector yeah. and you know we talk about what the issues are we talk about some potential solutions as well uh, so we hope you enjoy the chat as we did we'll get straight to it now but for now on with the podcast thank you very much for coming along to chat to us today um i'm going to begin with you corey you're a prolific writer i think it's fair to say <laughs> written dozens of books in um, fact fiction short and long and graphic novels as well um did you always want to be a writer? Was that the thing that you always wanted to do? I did. Uh, I was six years old when my folks took me on the family dinosaur in 1977 to see Star Wars, which I am not one of those people who will say, oh, it's the greatest movie ever made. But in 1977, there was almost no programming for kids on telly. We, VCRs hadn't been uh, widely distributed. And uh, with our couple of broadcast channels, the only children's programming that we got was the mandatory children's programming and to keep their broadcast license. And to make it as cheap as possible, they got donated content, which came from the Methodists, who had a, a stop-motion animation cartoon <laughs> called uh, Davy and Goliath, which was just Bible lessons. Okay. And it was, <laughs> to suffice it to say, there was not a lot of drama in this. And then there was, you know... Um, there was uh, uh, some, you know, public television for very small kids, and there was uh, Looney, Looney Tunes, and nothing else. And so, going and seeing a show that had plot reversals, multiple points of view, out of chronology storytelling, you know, fake outs, all of that stuff, was really mind blowing. And when I got back, I wanted to figure out how the story worked, and I got some, um, you know, A4, and I folded it in half and stapled it down the middle like a like a book size. Mm -hmm. And then I just wrote out the story over and over again, like a kid practicing scales on the piano. And you know, my parents were very supportive of it. They thought it was great. And I got kind of, I guess, heaped with praise. It felt good. And I think that a lot of what we call talent is just not noticing that you were practicing because it was fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so years later, when I began to write more seriously, I had a knack for it. And I think that that knack just came from having been encouraged having found, uh, you know, positive experiences. And, you know, I don't want to spend too long on this, but in Toronto it was in the 80s, it was a great time to want to be a writer. We, we had, uh, in particular, um, one person who was kind of the doyen of the science fiction scene, a woman named Judith Merrill, who was the, uh, you know, kind of groundbreaking editor, writer, critic. She, she was the, also the doyen of the English New Wave. Uh, she came over here and edited an anthology called England Swings with Michael Moorcock. She was a real towering figure. And she'd gone into voluntary exile in Toronto after the Chicago police riots. She'd, she'd given up her American residence. And uh, she donated her books to the local library system uh, and started what is now the largest science fiction reference collection in the world. And she was the writer in residence. And starting at the age of about nine or ten on a school trip, I went down and was told, anytime you want, you bring a manuscript down and Judy will critique it for you. Wow. And so from that age on, I had one of the great figures of the field critiquing my work. And she started so many different projects and uh, institutions and 
um, you know, uh, magazines and whatnot and writing workshops. And I just ended up, because I was in her orbit, I ended up in a peer workshop of other people who'd been in her orbit. And she found us a community center to meet and she didn't over, oversee it. She just was like, okay, you guys are all at the same place. You should yeah. do it. I worked in the books, science fiction bookstore that she had inveigled a local fan to, to found, which is now the oldest science fiction bookstore in the world. I went to monthly potluck dinners that she'd organized. You know, I, I, I was sort of like in her orbit. And so it was, it was the closest thing to a formal apprenticeship for science fiction yeah, writing yeah. that anyone has ever had. And so I went, you know, smoothly transitioned from seeing this movie in 1977 to having a, a relatively easy entree into the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, as you say, an apprenticeship there. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Rebecca, you're a professor at uh, Melbourne uh, Law School and creator's rights, uh, regulation of technology, that's something which you research. And so you're kind of coming into this book, which we'll get to very quickly, from a scholarly a scholarly angle, I suppose. Is that right? And is that is it something you always wanted to do, is to move into this kind of area? Well, I suppose a scholarly angle, but also an angle that, from somebody who just really loves books and reading and art and culture. Yeah. Um, my background's very different to Corey's. I grew up in a house without any books in it, really, mm. um, but always starving for stuff to read. I was one of those little kids that walks around um, with a, their nose in a book, walking into trees and things, because it was so much more interesting to find out what happened next in the story yeah. than to see where I was going. <laughs> um, and so I think I... I read, 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 um, and it was, you know, going to raiding school libraries and charity shops and negotiating really hard with the softest touch volunteers. I could get amazing deals on books. <laughs> it was like seven and adorable, um, and I would sort of totter home with these great big piles of them. Um, and so that, you know, it's a pretty, a pretty obvious creation story when you see it. You know, I've, I've worked now for almost 20 years um, on you know, creators' rights and, and issues around access to knowledge and culture. Both of them are really, really close to my heart. Um, and this is my third book, but uh, I like to say it's the first one anyone's actually reading. Um, <laughs> it, it, it definitely helps to write a book with Cory Doctorow in terms of getting people to pay attention to it. <laughs> and uh, the book that we're talking about is uh, Choke Point Capitalism, which is, on the day we record this, it's out today in the UK. Um, does one of you want to sort of summarize what it's, what it's about? Um, sure. So, you know, Rebecca and I have both been active in copyright reform, and we've watched for, you know, decades between us and in each of us, really, as copyright has expanded, you know, the, the duration of copyright, the scope of copyright, the penalties available uh, under copyright law, the ease with which you can prove an infringement, all of those things have, have only expanded. There's been lots of collateral damage. The arts industry has gotten bigger and more profitable, but the share of income, both in real terms and proportionally going to artists, has only declined. And so it, it seemed to us that there needed to be an explanation for how it is that you could create more so-called artist rights and not have them accruing to artists. And the model that we've conceived of analogizes giving artists copyright to like giving your bullied kid extra lunch money. Um, <laughs> the, the fact that the kid starts the day with extra lunch money doesn't help them if they have to go through the school gates where the bullies will take whatever they've got in their pockets. And you know, if the bullies are out there campaigning to help the hungry children of your land by giving them more lunch money, it doesn't mean that they're going to let them keep the lunch money. Since copyright is alienable, since copyrights are, are designed to be separated from the people who create them. That's why they're valuable, right? You have the right yeah. to control who can publish your book. You sell that to a publisher, the publisher pays you. Um, once there is a very small number of firms that control access to your audience, once there's a choke point with audiences on this side and creators on this side, whatever rights you have are gonna get taken off of you as you go through that little pinch point. And once you don't have any rights, once you can be abused with impunity to to, on the way to that audience, um, everything about how you are treated in the market will get worse. And it doesn't matter whether that choke point is run by a tech company or an entertainment company. You know, this futile business of saying, well, I support Google. No, I support Bertelsmann. Yeah. Well, I support YouTube. No, I support Warners. It doesn't matter which one you support, right? They, whichever ogre wins the battle of the giants is not going to drop more crumbs for you because you cheered them on while they were taking over the market. The, the only thing that you can hope for is that um, uh, whichever one wins uh, doesn't even notice you to steal from you. <laughs> um, and so what we wanted to do was write a book that analyzed 
how those markets work, how those um, scams work. The first half of the book is just these anatomies of these very baroque accounting scams that separate creators from the revenue that's that's rightfully theirs. But then the second half of the book is how we can fix it. Mm. We're not complaining about just sort of the the regular middlemen that we need to keep the culture industries yeah. running here. We're not we're not we're not talking about bookstores. We're not mm. talking about you know independent record labels. We're talking about the ones who deliberately set out to eliminate competition. Mm. Right? And the orthodoxy is we're, we're told by economists don't worry about increased corporate concentration because that will be competed away. Like as soon as somebody captures a nice big juicy yeah. market, others will come in and they'll compete it away. But um, the, the sort of today's robber barons have got really good at cementing in what were supposed to be temporary advantages right, and creating these ongoing choke points. So, you know, Peter Thiel says competition is for losers. That's the orthodoxy now taught in business schools. Like, how do you stop people from taking away your markets? And so copyright, we can see actually, and we show it in the book, particularly in the music industry, how copyrights um, end up really hurting artists because you've got these three gigantic record labels that control almost 70% of global song rights. They own the three music publishers that control almost 60% of global song rights. And through having those enormous reservoirs of rights, they're able to use that to control the future of music markets. And of course, they design that to work to their advantage, not to the advantage of the musicians that who's, yeah, whose rights absolutely. they've taken. I and mean, it's the same thing with digital rights management. That was supposed to. So those are like the digital locks that are put on books. You see them, you know, on, on Kindle and on Audible for audiobooks. Those are supposed to help um, copyright owners uh, in in the war against piracy, yeah. and that's what that's how they're sold, right? But what they're actually doing here is they're helping Amazon maintain its dominance over the ebook and and audiobook mm -hmm. markets because nobody wants to have to maintain multiple libraries and nobody wants to have to give up you know access to some of the books they've already bought by switching to somebody new so that's another way of locking customers in which is the main game because once you've locked your customers in then you've locked in your suppliers yeah. too yeah. right yeah. once you control the markets for readers of books publish and, publishers and authors have got no choice but to fall into line as well I mean and as well you get situations I don't know if it's covered in the book or not, but the there's the I can't remember his name now. The the author that that wrote something in Disney. Oh, um, Alan Dean Foster. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, there are a lot of instances of this. I, I, I can I swear on your absolutely. Podcast? Could you tell? So, should we start with the story? Because maybe some people listening. Don't sure. Know about yeah. This. Well, yeah. I, I, we do talk about it in the book, but it's yeah. So Alan Dean Foster is one of the instances we cover. We cover some others, and and more broadly, this is when a firm does something absolutely ridiculous and you say, why have you done this to me? And they say, because we can. You know, the, as I say, the, the generally account, accepted accounting practice name for this is fuck you, that's why. <laughs> so here's a fuck you, that's why. Alan Dean Foster is a very beloved science fiction writer. As it turns out, he's got a Star Wars nexus. Uh, when George Lucas was whomping up Star, Star Wars, hadn't made it yet, he asked him if he would write the novelization. He wrote the novelization and had so many good ideas that it became the plot of the movie. Um, he went on to be just an absolutely beloved science fiction writer of every kind. He wrote lots of novelizations. He wrote lots of his own work. Um, his novelizations are surprisingly good. They're not hack work. Uh, and they sell, and they sell, and they sell, and they sell. So Disney went on this orgy of acquisitions. They bought Lucas, they bought Fox, they you know bought Pixar, um, and uh, you know in this regard they're not dissimilar from other large firms. We we think of uh, Google as an idea factory, but when you look more closely, they've made a browser, a search engine, a Hotmail clone. And everything else is something they bought from someone yeah, else. Yeah. And everything that they've done in-house is something that failed. Yeah. Right? Google, <laughs> Google Video failed. They made that in-house. YouTube, they bought from someone else. That's a success. And so um, Disney grew by the same way. It went out and bought a bunch of its competitors. Uh, and um, it took this very curious position. It said, when we bought Fox and Lucas, we bought their assets but not their liabilities. Mm -hmm. So we bought the right to publish Alan Dean Foster's books, but not the obligation to pay him when we do so. And they said to Alan Dean Foster, well, they didn't say anything to Alan Dean Foster. They refused to return his phone calls. They refused to return his agent's phone calls. And eventually when they were called out and, and brought to heel a little, they, they explained this to him and they said, maybe we can negotiate with you, but the first thing you're gonna have to do is sign a non-disclosure agreement, which he refused to do. Foster is an old man. His wife is dying of cancer. He is not 
in a great position to be bargaining with him, but he stuck to his guns, and writers and fans all over the world rose up. And I understand that he's gotten what's due to him, but there are a lot of similarly situated writers who haven't. Yeah. Mm. Uh. And that's despite, you know, it's a couple years now, sustained pressure, public shaming, right? And you know, you know how the law works. It's, you don't get to buy. <laughs> you don't get to buy the, the um, the benefits of a contract, but not the responsibilities of it. This yeah. is just a wild legal theory, but they are. You know, it's so expensive to to actually litigate yeah, against anybody really like this, and they know that almost like there's almost no chance anyone will. And if someone does, you know, manage to muster the resources to create a scary threat, then they'll get them to settle, and they'll make that go away. Yeah. And this is what we ha we see playing out in every culture industry that has powerful corporations. It's the same with the record labels again. You know, in the United States, there is a termination law that allows creators to get their rights back 35 years after transferring them. Now, it was supposed to be automatic and apply after 25 years. It became um, after 35 years and you've got to jump through so many ludicrous hoops that very few people can actually do it. Um, and what happens in, and, and, and the record labels in particular keep arguing that you, know, you can't do it for music. And anytime there is, you know, somebody like a Paul McCartney, right, who could actually push this, they, they take it to settlement, so there's no precedent yeah. anyone else can rely upon, yeah. right? And so this is another way in which the, the, the creator shakedown continues. Yeah. I, I want to give you an example of another fuck you, that's why, uh, <laughs> from the book, from the record industry. Um, in, in, until pretty recently, digital record royalty statements had a deduction that was for breakage. Now, breakage as a deduction originates with when shellac records were moved by lorry to the record stores in the high street. And it refers to records that shattered on impact. They were charging breakage on MP3s. And again, <laughs> the GAAP basis for this is fuck you, that's why. Right? We are big, you are small, you can't afford to sue us. And so that's one of the hazards of, of, of letting firms get very large. It, you know, And I think that it would be wrong to assume that these firms are run by exceptional people. They're not exceptionally brilliant and they're not exceptionally evil. I think that uh, there are there have been unscrupulous people in the arts since the year dot. Yeah. Uh, here we are in Scotland, the, the origin note of the fight between the, the Scottish uh, Guild of Stationers and the English Guild of Stationers and the Statute of Anne and the first copyright law, which was all about this sort of thing. The difference is how much power they have. Uh, it's that 40 years ago, under Thatcher and Reagan, Mulroney in Canada, we decided to stop enforcing antitrust law. We started to let firms merge to dominance. And when you give ordinary mediocrities no better than you and me unlimited power, they behave with all of the follies and greed and failings that every, ordinary mediocrities like you and me would do if we were given unlimited and unchecked power. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's interesting because I mean, you look at someone like Amazon, I suppose, and a lot of people that something that we've chatted to in the past on the podcast have viewed the rise of Amazon as a good thing in the sense of opening up new paths for authors to to get the work out there. You know, self publishing and the Kindle market, and I totally appreciate that that you are putting work into this kind of into their into their basket, I suppose. But it, they have also opened up avenues that weren't available before, and is, is that not a good thing? Yeah, no, you're, it's totally true. And I think the shell game they want to play is that the only way you could break open the uh, dominance of the big six publishers when a few years ago, now big five, nearly big four, depending yeah. on whether this merger goes through, is not just by having self-publishing platforms or easy online ebook platforms, but also that they have to be as abusive as possible. That that is somehow integral to the project, right? It's the same thing Google wants you to believe, that the only way you could possibly search the internet is also be by being spied on in the most comprehensive ways, peeled open like a, you know, from asshole to appetite in order to just look at the internet, right? We know that you can make a Google without spying because Google didn't have any spying for the first five years. Mm -hmm. We know that you can make a Facebook without spying because Facebook didn't start spying until 2008. We know that you can make an Amazon that doesn't rip off authors because when it was pl trying to lure authors onto the platform, it treated them very well. And it was only when it had dominance that it turned around and started screwing them. And so we're all for the benefits of new technology and the benefits of the old industry because you know i'm published by macmillan i love them they're nice people um, i think that there's gr lots to admire about them and i think that the things that they do that i dislike 
can easily be separated from the things that they do that I enjoy and that we can go on having a fruitful relationship without permitting them to overstep what firms should be allowed to do. Yeah. And and I just wanted to ask about the the writing process of this when there's two two people working on something like this. I mean, how how did that work? How did you? We used a Ouija board. <laughs> <laughs> this was um, maybe I could tell you a little bit about how we came to write this book together. Yeah. Um, we'd had this amazing discussion in a taxi in Melbourne in in 2018, where we really saw that we were both seeing this as a problem of 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 big rather than you know uh, not enough copyright or creators not working hard enough or anything like that. Then fast forward to when the world ended. It's um it's it's March or April 2020. I'm locked up in my apartment, um, and all of the work I had for that that year planned was cancelled, and so I thought this was actually very freeing because this was the story that I so wanted to tell, and I started working on it, and um and I realised this would be so much better if Corey worked on it with me. Um, and you can actually just email Corey Doctor and ask if he'll write a book with you. He'll probably say yes. Uh, he did for me anyway. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. Uh, but um, he really didn't have a lot of time. Uh, he was writing a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, and um, I had a lot of time because I was locked in Melbourne, which you might have heard it didn't go that well for us uh, with, the, with the lockdowns. Um, and so we, we came up with, uh, I've written, I've written, um, I've had a few major co-authors and every single one, it's a different project. Process. Mm. For this one, we would have like a really long chat um, every couple of weeks. We we're doing a chapter every two weeks, I think. Um, we'd have a really long chat and we would um, just sort of think about the shape of it and the ideas that we wanted in it. Usually I would lead the first draft, sometimes Corey would, um, and then we would swap. And so um, having Cor knowing that Corey was going to be editing my work and reviewing my work, um, forced me to become a much better writer because I was too embarrassed to give him <laughs> anything too bad. But then also um, seeing the edits that would come through uh, really helped then, I think, improve my writing. for that. So I think that's been a, a wonderful thing. I'm not sure if I've ever told you that, but like, a, a wonderful thing that's come out of this project is I can see the effects of that in my writing because cool. uh, it was also like a year-long apprenticeship from a science fiction writing master yeah. um, that I brought into my work. Um, and then, yeah, and then we would just, and usually it would work pretty well and sometimes there'd be something not working. We'd just keep banging, keep yeah. banging away and at it. You know, I've worked now with the Electronic Frontier Foundation for 20 years mm -hmm. yeah. and it's filled with brilliant people with legal training who care about the same issues as me. And a lot of my work for 20 years has been taking their drafts and rewriting them. I, I don't think we've mm -hmm. ever talked about this, but that's, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've been doing that with, I did it with Gwen and I did mm -hmm. it with Fred von Lohmann mm -hmm. and I've done it with Cindy and I've done it with all kinds of lawyers that we yeah. know yeah. Uh, who have um, similar backgrounds and interests mm -hmm. and so on. And, and there is a, there is a, a kind of, um, you know, method to, taking arguments that are uh, constructed in the way that you would uh, legal argument and making it into a, uh, a kind of um, lay argument. And mm -hmm. it, it's, you know, it's the, the, there's, it's not a formula, but there is a kind of, you, as you do it for a while, it gets um, a lot easier as well. Yeah. And, and how does it compare with writing a book with someone to your other work when you've written a book by by yourself? You know, is it quite nice having someone to bounce stuff off or do you prefer having the control? It's both. I mean, as, <laughs> as, as you would say, you know, as everyone says, uh, when two people write a book, each of them does 75% of the work. Uh, I just, we just came from lunch with Charlie Strauss, who lives here in Edinburgh, who I wrote a book with some years ago. Uh, and it was much the same with him. You know, the, I mean, the process was very different, but, it, you know, it was more work than writing half a book. It was less work than writing a whole book. It was probably more work in aggregate overall, but then you also get the benefit of rubbing your ideas up against someone else's and, and so on. Mm, yeah, that was so difficult because I, I probably spent three weeks, three weeks working on it by myself before I emailed Corey. And it was exhilarating, but it was also so hard to just argue with myself on mm -hmm. this stuff. Yeah. You know, these were, these were new, a lot of this was new ideas for me. It was outside of my comfort zone, but it was a story I desperately needed to tell. Um, and Corey desperately needed to tell it as well. So even though his agent said, do not write this book with this Australian woman. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> and uh, as well, Corey, you've, you've obviously written uh, fiction, you've written uh, non-fiction quite a lot. And I was just wondering, how do you decide when, when you're going to take an idea and push it into a fiction route? And when are you going to stick with the nonfiction? And is is there sometimes a, a time when it's 
easier to get a message across if you're if you're telling it in a fictitious way. Well, you know, I I generally do both. I mean, there aren't a lot of themes that I've explored in fiction that I haven't explored in nonfiction and vice versa. So it's not so much a, like which of these ideas is a good fiction. Obviously, some ideas are. Um, intrinsically fictional in as much as if you're writing a story. Ben Rosenbaum and I wrote a story about um, uh, far future planet-sized intelligences set 10,000 okay. years in the future simulating each other. That was not going to be a non-fiction book. Um, although I do write a lot of uh, computer science oriented non-fiction about simulation and how in information security context it's very hard to know when a, for a program to know whether it's running on in a computer or in a, another program and how this has all these implications for policy and information security and so on. So there are ways in which I address those in, in fiction too, I suppose. Um, and, and you know, I think that they're very complementary, you know, and it, with a two-part epoxy, you've got some that's rigid and brittle and you've got some that's sort of gooey uh, and will fill all the cracks but, but it pulls apart easily and you mix them together and you get something that's resilient. And fiction, you know, it's not, it, it, if, if fiction is like dictating a crisp argument to you, it's really not fiction. And at that point, it's, it's not yeah, fiction. Yeah. But fiction can give you a kind of emotional resonance for how an idea feels. Mm -hmm. And then the idea can be very crisply articulated in nonfiction. And they work like two-part epoxy. You know, here's the nonfiction. It's a policy. I turned a book into Verso the day before yesterday, two days, three days ago now, uh, about, um, you know, tech policy. Uh, it explores the, many of the same themes that are in the novel that I'm working on right now, and they really are very intensely complementary. I was I was really interested that you guys used um, used the Kickstarter route for the audible for the audio book version. Sorry, of this, not the audible version. Of this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, you raised over hundred thousand for it. It was obviously people really responded to that. And is is, is that a clear message from people? You think that there is. People are interested in alternative ways of obtaining books rather than going through the kind of usual platforms. I, th I think the chapter on Audible, Audible's abuses, um, particularly with regard to independent authors, is one of the most powerful and outraging parts of the book. Um, Corey has never allowed his books to be made mm -hmm. available on Audible because of their compulsory DRM. Um, and other abuses. And his agent has a, <laughs> I say this, his agents told him that uh, what he's given up by not having his books on, his audiobooks on Audible is um, paying off the mortgage on his house and um, funding his child's college education. <laughs> so we're talking about a very yeah. strong yeah. principled stance that's gonna hurt yeah. um, substantially. I think I think that this is right. There's, there's a lot of people don't understand exactly how dangerous um, Audible stranglehold is, and the way in which now they've got that dominance, they're using it to squeeze authors and independent publishers in particular, and how they will continue to squeeze everybody else. The more power that they've got, a famous Bezos aphorism is "Your margin is my opportunity," right? And he puts that into practice every time he can. Um, you know, a more familiar story might be the Gazelle Project. Um, some people have heard of that. When Amazon first started getting um, power over the book industry, they wanted to improve their margins, and they literally created something called Project Gazelle, whereby they went after the smaller, weaker publishers first to shake them down for more margin, right? Which they could then use to like lock customers in more and eliminate comp competition. And then you know, once they've got all of this in place, that's when they can really squeeze everybody. And they called so, it Project Gazelle because mm. it was like a cheetah bringing down yeah. a weak yeah. gazelle. Yeah, yeah. That was the only part the lawyers objected to as far as we can tell. Don't call it that. Don't say the quiet part yeah. out loud. Project, project right. premeditated yeah. murder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so this is the playbook that they're all they're all playing by. That's what we show in the book, right? And it wasn't really, it was we were quite far in. We, we looked at all of these different culture industries and, and after a while we realized, well, like, this is exactly the same thing every time. And so this is, I think, you know, the, the reasons why a lot of people are starting to feel uncomfortable with Audible are the reasons why we need to feel uncomfortable with everything else. But um, it was so terrific that people were interested in supporting the Kickstarter because there's no way we could have financed and We had to self-finance the audiobook and hope that people would listen yeah. to it. Yeah. And after the, the Kickstarter, I mean, you can buy it from all, um, from, from all audiobook supplies that don't have mandatory DRM. 
Which um, is everything except Audible and, and Apple, Apple, right? <laughs> which so that, is ninety-five percent of the market. That's right. So you know, apart from the Kickstarter, we're going to sell very, very, very few of these. Right? So it's um, amazing that we had the opportunity yeah. to make yeah. the audio version, but a lot of people just don't. But but would you would you say to you know an aspiring author that wants to get their book out there to avoid Amazon? Then should they not be using that service? Um, well, so the thing that we were worried about was not Amazon per se. I, I don't think there's any way to avoid Amazon. It's the mandatory DRM because right. the, the Article 6 of the European Copyright Directive and Section 12.1 of the American Digital Millennium Copyright Act makes it illegal to remove DRM. And the DRM locks it to Amazon's platform forever. So you as the copyright proprietor, the person who owns the copyright in your audiobook, can't authorize your listeners to to yeah. convert those books and take them somewhere else. So in terms of the danger of giving Amazon uh, uh, access to a copyrighted work, this is particularly dangerous. It's dangerous in a way that exceeds the risk of just letting them sell your eBooks without DRM. I don't think that you can function without selling on Amazon. I, and, and I don't think people sh should have to try. I mean, this is like um, trying to recycle your way out of climate change. Yeah. These are systemic problems. They don't have individual solutions. That's why the second half of the book is all about systemic solutions. So we mentioned before that Alan Dean Foster was told that if he wanted to uh, get out of get some money from Disney that they owed him that he'd have to enter into non-disclosure uh, And that would mean that he couldn't disclose what percentage of what he thought they owed him They were willing to give him which would give other people an edge like they could say hey We hear you settled with Alan Dean Foster for 70% of, of what uh, you owed him You're gonna have to give my client 70% yeah. 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 too It also means that they couldn't explain what they discovered when they audited Disney's books or looked inside You know mm -hmm. all of these things that would help other people now as it turns out This is universal in royalty contracts that royalty contracts usually have the right to audit When you do find irregularities and you ask for your money They tell you that if you want your money You're gonna have to sue them or if you want a settlement at a discount You're gonna have to sign a non-disclosure now, it's very frequent that money is owed to you in these royalty arrangements. Um, we cite one entity in the book. It's a firm that has done tens of thousands of record label audits. Um, every time they found an accounting error, except for once, that accounting error redounded to the favor of the record label. It was an isolated probability storm. <laughs> we, can't, we can't really figure out how that happened. But yeah, they rolled the coin a hundred times, and every single time it landed on its edge. It's, it's amazing. So it... You know, here's the thing, right? Contract law is a creature of state law. Uh, all these contracts are consummated in California and New York, and then Washington because of Amazon, and Tennessee because of Nashville. State laws are among the easiest to get passed, They're much easier than federal laws and regulations. If each of these states, or even one or two of them, were to introduce a bill that said, as a matter of public policy, non-disclosure is not enforceable, where it pertains to material omissions or misstatements, in uh, uh, royalty statements that were down to the detriment of royalty collecting creative workers, you'd put more money in the pockets of more artists at the stroke of a pen instantly all over the world than all the copyright term extensions of the last 40 years combined. And you know that's not a thing that you're going to solve as an individual creator, um, it, it's, but it is a thing that will do better for us. And it's the kind of thing that arts organizations really could advocate for, and also MPs and MEPs and MLAs and so on could, could advocate for when they are sincerely motivated to do something about artists' fortunes. You know, we had really powerful artists, powerful voices like Paul McCartney and, and Debbie Harry who advocated for the disastrous European Copyright Directive in 2019 and mandatory copyright filters. If they had instead bent their oars to doing something about non-disclosure, instead of just ensuring that the only companies that are going to offer social media in Europe from now on are going to be giant American companies that can exploit artists because they don't have any competition, they could have opened up a choke point and gotten artists all over the world paid. And that's the thing that we really need to focus our energy on. Yeah, so we need, we need um, better audit rights. We need transparency rights, which is one um, good thing that was in that, that 2019 Digital Single Market Directive. Um, Artists and uh, member states are now obliged to um, uh, enact laws that uh, provide information about, that, that require information to be provided about how um, works are being used, what kind of money is coming in, and, and how the pay is being calculated. That's terrifically important, although, again, we see there's a lot of pressure to implement those in ways that are not particularly mm -hmm. useful to artists and performers. Um, there's another really important uh, intervention around 
um, contract. But as soon as you see the, the problem as being one as about too much power, about these choke points, then you can see that, that the solutions need to be about widening them out. So there are all of those interventions, but there's also ways that we can do things like create minimum wages for creative work by rethinking statutory licenses around music, um, uh, ways that we can find more money by reforming the, the, the practice. So there's, there's a lot of leakage um, in, in terms of the, the, the money that just disappears because of real inefficiencies in collecting societies as well as corruption and so on. Um, the, there's just so many things that we could do if we actually focused, instead of this really non-nuanced discussion about do you want more copyright or do you hate artists, yeah. right? We need nuanced discussions about how do we get that lunch money mm -hmm. into artists' pockets and how do we keep it there? Well, yeah. one Because one thing that I've started to see, and I don't know if it's a, re a trend that I've just noticed or if it's a recent trend, is that often you'll get a new book that comes out and then in hardback and within a few weeks it's like 99, 99 pence on the Kindle store or 99 cents and and I kind of wonder you know that is such an it's a great deal for the reader obviously but for the writer it's 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 a massive drop in sales of the, the and, and and how how sustainable is is that model for writers and writers in general in terms of advances getting smaller and shrunk down we've heard a lot of stuff coming out of the court case with Simon Schuster etc with how much advances were you know what is the publishing model as it stands sustainable for writers going forward well look whenever you have a supply chain that has monopolies in it those monopolies clobber everyone else in the supply chain unless they can form counter monopolies so uh, in in the US uh, book selling context when there were lots and lots of retailers that sold books outside of bookstores, so what, what was called the mass market, um, chemists, grocers, so on. Um, there were lots of distributors that serviced them. There were about 400 distributors across the country. They stocked huge numbers of titles. Um, in fact, they had unionized Teamsters who had long-term job security negotiated bonuses if the uh, books that they put in the little pockets in the chemist shop uh, sold through instead of being stripped and returned for a uh, credit. And as a result, they got really good at figuring out what was read where. Um, my editor, who's a, now Vice President McMillan, uh, started off as a 14-year-old kid who walked into a chemist in suburban Phoenix, Phoenix and found a weird um, Samuel Delaney novel in which dolphins had sex with humans, like super <laughs> weird 1960s avant-garde science fiction in suburban Phoenician uh, ph pharmacies, right? Um, when uh, we took the brakes off of retail consolidation in the big box stores like Walmart and Costco and so on spread across the US, uh, they demanded a single distributor. Uh, the distributors collapsed down to three. Um, those distributors put the screws to the publishers. The publishers began to merge as well. When I started in writing, there were a couple of dozen in New York. Now there's five major publishers in New York. Um, the distributors began to gouge the publishers. Uh, I had a book with a, one of the great little presses, uh, Four Walls, Eight Windows, my, my second short story collection. And a week before it came out, uh, Publishers Group West, which was a great little distributor that had been bought by one of these giant distributors, collapsed because uh, all of the executives of its parent company were led to the office in handcuffs by the FBI for systemic fraud. And Publishers Group West collapsed, and with it, dozens of small America, uh, New York publishing houses all collapsed as well. I never met my editor. Uh, the book came out, my editor was gone by the time it was there. I went through like seven editors on paper, never spoke to any of them. It was effectively orphaned. Um, it, it was a remarkable experience, and that's what you get when you get Monopoly. So you, then you get um, distributors who are consolidated, publishers who are consolidated, and at either end of the supply chain, you've got readers and writers. And readers and writers are not consolidated. We are sort of flapping around and we're loose ends. And while it's true, Publishers think they should get more money than distributors. Distributors think they should get more money than the retailers. Um, they all agree that the rest of us should either get paid as little as possible for writers yeah. or pay as much as possible for readers. And um, you can see anyone who's not organized being uh, hit in that way. You know, libraries are relatively disorganized, so they're being gouged on ebooks, where now a library will pay 10x what you or I will pay for an ebook, and our ebook, which will nominally last forever, as long as our hard drive is good, uh, is, is much more valuable. Theirs evaporates after 26 circulations or a couple of reads, uh, that, that, or a couple of years, rather. So that's um, the story that you're seeing. And so when you see a publisher being arm-twisted into selling a Kindle edition for 99 cents, you're just seeing how power is working in these highly monopolized sectors. 
And so what is the, uh, I, I know you cover this in the book, but in, in, a, in a sort of short form, especially from the point of view of writers and, and, and authors and stuff, what should they be doing? Is it, is it joining things like the Society of Authors and putting pressure through them on these, these companies? Yeah, solidarity, collective action is really important. Um, one of the, the, the groups that we worked with when we were writing this book was the Writers Guild of America, mm -hmm. and particularly David Goodman, who was the president at the time. They were in a strike against the big four Hollywood talent agencies who had created their own choke point. Um, they had hoovered up, signed all of talent, and then created these um, just really incredible conflicts of interest that, that meant that they were feathering their own nests instead of actually representing these people. The writers realized that if they, you know, that, 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 that it was despite the fact it's the golden, the golden age of television, they had a declining share, their conditions were just worsening, and they realized that they had to act now or they were gonna lose everything that they'd ever fought for. And so um, in a single week, 7,000 Hollywood writers fired their agents, right? Uh -huh. And said that they were not going to work with them again until they got rid of those conflicts of interest and signed onto a new code of conduct. And what David told us um, when we did an event together on our launch day in the United States in Beverly Hills, uh, what he was saying is that it took them a really long time to realize that these, these agents only had the power that the writers gave them. Right, that okay, individually, the, the Hollywood writers didn't have any power, but together, once they're working together, without the writing, mm -hmm. the agencies had nothing, yeah. Yeah. okay? And so this, I think, is just a really important lesson. I think a lot of creative workers don't identify as workers, right? They're, we're, they're not, we're, we're not labor, mm -hmm. um, but we are, we, we all are, and we need to see that this is a shared fight, that we need to, to work together to demand better conditions. It's, because especially because I think writers, Often, you know, it's a very solitary thing. That's a lot so of the solitary. Time. Yeah, and that's you don't right. Really think about it, yeah, and I think as well, um, you know, I've heard from a lot of writer friends that when they're not doing f well financially from their books, they don't see this as a structural problem. They see it as a personal inadequacy that mm -hmm. their writing's not good enough, yeah. their marketing's no not good enough, do. they're yeah. not breaking through. Yeah, but actually, so many people are, are facing the same problem, and so I think that that message is such an important one that that everybody is part of the same struggle. And that if we want things to change, we can actually get that by demanding it together because even Amazon only has the power that we give it. Mm -hmm. yeah. right? And look, it's not, it's not, it's not a simple one, one fixed solution, right? There's no miracle cure for this. Um, it's one step at a time. Right, the same way you eat an elephant, as Corey yeah. likes to say. <laughs> right? One bite at a time. One bite at a time. Um, Apparently, I would step my way through eating an yeah. elephant, so I haven't even got the first bit right. Um, but 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 we can do this, right? Like so, things like, for example, making it easier for for um, for, for people to migrate their libraries away to a less abusive sellers, right? That's interop interoperability, one of the things that we talk about in the book. Right? If you could just migrate your libraries, it would make it so much easier for authors to create a co-op, for example, right, where they could get the retail share. Corey's got uh, his own; he sells his eBooks um, directly on his website. Um, and he gets the retailer share that would otherwise go to Amazon, yeah. right? We've that's where there is actually some money that could that could go to authors um, and could be taken away from Amazon. But we need to provide the conditions to make it easier for that to happen. And you know, to, to quote an, an Edinburghian, uh, James Boyle is a law professor and a, a friend of ours. He he runs the Center for the Public Domain with Jennifer Jenkins at Duke University. He talks about how before the term ecology became widespread. Uh, people didn't know that they were on the same side. You know, if you care about owls and I care about the ozone layer, like, how do we know that, you know, the gaseous composition of the upper atmosphere is actually the same issue as the destiny of charismatic nocturnal avians, right? <laughs> but the term ecology takes a bunch of issues and makes a movement out of it. And today, you have creators who are worried about excessive firepower and monopoly in uh, the arts, but, you know, you have beer drinkers who are pissed off that two companies control all the beer. And you have people who rely on international shipping who are like, there's only three shipping cartels left. Mm, yeah. And they've been ignoring their uh, regulators for years and years when they said eventually one of these big ships is going to get stuck in the Suez Canal and now we're all <laughs> screwed. Um, all the eyeglasses in, the, in this country, in the world, come from an Italian French monopolist called uh, Luxottica Essilor. They bought all the high street retailers, so they own um, 
uh, lens crafters and they own Sunglass Hut and so on. Okay. They they bought every eyewear brand you've ever heard of. So whether you're buying Dolce & Gabbana or Oliver Peoples or, mm -hmm. or, or Coach, they're all coming from the same company. Uh, and when companies wouldn't sell like Oakley, they said, great, you're just not for sale in, in any of the major retailers. A year later, they went and they bought them back for 10 cents in the dollar. <laughs> they also own Essilor, which makes more than 50% of the lenses in the world. And they own iMed, which is the largest eyewear insurer in the world. And the price of glasses has gone up 1,000% over the last 10 years. So you might think you're pissed off about glasses mm -hmm. or international shipping or beer or cheerleading or any one of the other industries that have consolidated down to one, two, three, four, sometimes five firms. What you're really pissed off about is excessive corporate power and concentration. And that's how we make a movement that changes the world. It's not going to be, I mean, writers are powerful, but we're not that powerful. You know, notwithstanding the writer strike, which was an incredible example of solidarity yeah. in action. If, if it's a writer strike that also is part of a wider movement that includes other solidaristic groups, if writers understand that they have the shared destiny with um, public uh, employees, with uh, people in heavy industry, with Uber drivers, with everyone else, who's on the wrong side of a choke point. And if we all have each other's back, that's how we can make actual change. Yeah, I mean, it, it's some, it, when you talk about it like that, it is something that you recognize yeah. in society at the moment. You know, there is this gap and everyone is pissed off at everything. And there doesn't seem to yet be a coalescing around the idea that they need to work together to get through it. Well, I think it's starting to happen. The, the antitrust action, on both sides of the Atlantic and both sides of the channel is very inspiring. And actually, here's the thing that British people can do right now. Um, so yeah, the UK has got the um, world's largest, best staffed up technical antitrust division, the Digital Markets Unit, you know, the Competition Markets Authority, 50 full-time engineers. No other regulator in the world has this. It was created, I believe, in the coalition years. Uh, and they said, we'll do secondary legislation later to give them enforcement powers which no one's passed. Mm -hmm. So 50 full-time engineers on the public payroll writing incredible reports and they don't have any enforcement powers. So neither party has this in their manifesto. Uh, maybe we'll have an election soon, who knows? Mm -hmm. uh, but um, even if we don't, it would be an amazing thing for the leader of the opposition to stand up and talk about or for a backbencher mm -hmm. from the from the Tories to stand up and talk about. There's no good reason not to give these people enforcement powers. And if we did, we would unleash incredible power. Yeah. Uh, and because there is no such thing as an antitrust action that just redounds to the UK. That's a worldwide antitrust mm -hmm. action. Yeah, Man, that's, I, mean, I mean, I could literally talk about this for like all <laughs> days. It's yeah. absolutely fascinating, but we are running out of time. So I'm just gonna have to say, What's next for you guys? What have you got? Uh, you mentioned before we started to chat that you've got about seven books in the pipeline. I have seven more books. The, ne the next one's something called Red Team Blues. It's a, a noir thriller about a 67-year-old forensic accountant who spent 40 years tracking down and busting every scam in Silicon Valley, and he's ready to retire, but there's just one more job, a cryptocurrency <laughs> heist that turns out to be uh, involving two different international mafias uh, that he gets in the crossfire of. That's nice. great. That's nice. Nice. And I've got uh, 150 books coming out because, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> it's actually true. She really true. does. <laughs> um, plus one I'm writing myself. Uh, we, we, I started a little uh, a publishing house with my team last year. It's called Untapped, the Australian Literary Heritage Project. Um, this is about, you know, most in most countries, nearly all of your, your cultural literary heritage is out of print and lost. Um, that includes Australia. Uh, we started this project to bring a whole bunch of those books back. And it turns out, you know, we're testing lots of interesting questions like, you know, how um, our authors exercise their, their out of print rights in practice. Um, and, you know, what's the value of library promotion of ebooks and what's the relationship between library lending and, and book sales. But the really exciting thing is that we got to like save, save these books and there's an amazing collection we managed to put together. Um, and we have just sold the print rights uh, a, a little bit after that. So they are all coming out last month, this month and next month yeah. um, in, in print. So they'll be back in bookstores. So I've got quite a few books coming out, <laughs> um, plus the yeah, next yeah. one that's due for myself as well. But uh, if people are interested in that, check out untapped.org.au. We've got an incredible collection. Um, with you know half a dozen winners of our, our, our most glittering literary prize, the Miles Franklin, and so many um, Commonwealth Gold win Medal winners and so on, but just women writers, First Nations um, writers, um, really important Indigenous histories and local stories and memoirs. It's just it's really very close to my Brilliant. heart. No, we'll put a link fantastic. in the 
podcast description yeah. so people can see that. Um, well, th those were the main questions that we had, but we always end every podcast very quickly by asking our guests the same questions. Uh, the first of which is, what was the last book that you read? So for me, it was Douglas Rushkoff's Throwing Books at the Google Bus, which uh, it took six years to work its way to the top of my to-be-read to pile. Um, I, 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 got I, I finally had to because we did a, a, a talk with Doug, a panel together at the Ottawa International Writers' Festival a couple of weeks ago. We had so much fun. He's my new favorite person. And that's a, a really interesting book. Um, it, you know, We've got this assumption that corporate growth is is mandatory and natural and like this is what you have to have and he deconstructs that idea he shows where it comes from he shows how toxic it is and how dangerous it is for all of us um really recommend it and and i've just finished um nathan robinson's uh ar what's it called arguing with conservatives mm. uh it comes out in january i read it for a, a blurb and a and a, a review um it's really good he um uh, edits a magazine called the the um, Current Affairs, which he started by crowdfunding it. It's a leftist magazine, and its kind of unique selling proposition is that unlike other leftist publications, he takes right wing media very seriously. He he um, listens to all the interminable podcasts. He watches Fox. He um, <laughs> yeah. you know reads Dinesh D'Souza's books. He I get know, so stressed just thinking about it. Right now. He's really he's got a he's got a very um, he's got a strong stomach, and he starts the book by anatomizing how conservative arguments are constructed, uh, and then he uh, takes twenty five specific ones about abortion and race and immigration and so on, and he shows what the best version of those arguments are. He sh tells you what the weaknesses are, and he talks about how you can discuss it with people either to try and change their mind, which he says is sometimes worth doing, but more often to make sure that the other people who are listening uh, nearby um, come away with the right impression, don't, uh, don't get tricked into it. And then he ends the book quite remarkably with a section on what he agrees with conservatives about, like the Democrats are pretty useless, but also what conservatives do really well, right? The way that that rhetoric mm. is, is yeah. so successful and how it can be adapted to other political projects. It's a very good book. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it coming out. I think it's going to do a good business. Um, what about the last film that you guys watched? Oof. Um, that I can't tell you. We went to see Triangle of <laughs> Sadness before I left. Any uh, Meandering, but very funny and weird. Uh, cool. You know, ultimately very satisfying, but... Um, it, you know, my, afterwards my wife said, now I know what people mean when they say film is indulgent, self-indulgent, <laughs> yeah. right? It, it, was, it was a good two and a half hours and it could have easily been a good hour and a half. Yeah, yeah I've been on the road uh, for this, this book note tour just over eight weeks now and I haven't seen a single thing on that and I don't remember anything that happened in my life before this <laughs> began, so <laughs> I've got no answer for you. <laughs> uh, well, that, that, you, that'll apply to the next question as well, which is what's the last TV show that you watched? <laughs> eight weeks ago yeah I've got a I've got a 14 year old so I watch whatever she's interested in because it's one of the ways yeah. we can spend time with each other so she's discovered South Park mm -hmm. oh, right, okay. uh, yeah. which has 25 yeah, seasons a lot yes. of it, lots of uh, and um, you know it doesn't age well uh, <laughs> I mean a lot of what seemed like um, edgy humor was just actually sincere sociopathic beliefs yeah. uh, and also, like my fourteen-year-old doesn't know who Saddam Hussein was, yeah. uh, so there's a lot of there's a lot of explaining, but there's some of it that's very funny. And as a Canadian, the the shit that they pitch at Canadians, I find remarkably funny. <laughs> uh, and so it's a mixed bag. They they're not not funny, yeah. right? They are they are actually funny a lot of the time. Uh, the songs are legit funny, yeah. um, but it, it, it's also slightly uncomfortable. And you know, it's one of those things where like, watching problematic media with your 14 year old yeah. and figuring out how to talk about it is one of those like varsity level parenting things yeah. that you know, <laughs> you gotta figure um, out. And that was a very useful prompt actually, because it made me go, oh, actually season six of Rick and Morty had just started coming out before I left. <laughs> and so I, I saw an episode or two of that. That's yeah, my last not thing. Not started that season yet, so. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. They, they've come back. They've come back. There oh, was a bit okay. of a dark middle between season one and here, but it's, it's legit funny oh, again. Yeah. Oh, now, now I've said something controversial. <laughs> <laughs> well, the very, very final, final thing is a super quick fire, either or. And obviously there's no right answer here apart from one, but we'll start off with TV or cinema. Cinema. 
TV. <laughs> uh, night Owl or Early Bird? Early Bird. Night Owl. Okay, see so this is going to go. Music or no music when you're writing? Music. Always music. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, but not talking heads. Only talking heads. <laughs> yeah, another another Edinburghian, right? I, I, I only listen to Scottish music like talking heads. A uh, fancy restaurant or a takeaway? Fancy restaurant. I really like peasant food, but I'm happy to eat it in the restaurant. Yeah. Very good peasant yeah. food, but don't. I'm, I'm not in a molecular just a, gastronomy just a, phase. Just a, a, a trough of baked beans garnished <laughs> with a couple of dead dogs. <laughs> you know I'm gluten free and don't eat meat, Corey. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the last one, uh, which is a loaded question, if you real book or ebook. Uh, this is really context dependent for if me. If you strip right? away that, let's say real book or non Kindle ebook. So here's the thing mm -hmm. I think that ebooks are remarkable because they can be unlike books. So Wikipedia is an ebook. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in that regard, right, that, that liberation from the form, that kind of weird, very ambitious things that you can do with ebooks, I think is remarkable. And so if, if you were like, you can only have one book or you can have Wikipedia, I choose Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. Wikipedia that's right. mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, very context dependent, right? If, if I want the thing now, I need that information. I'm on a hike for six days, yeah. Yeah. right? I'm yeah. traveling. Like, there are so right. many reasons why I want an ebook. But if none of that is there, oh, and then there's other reasons I want an audiobook. But if none of that's there, I'll, I'll prefer the, the dead tree. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, people who, who are like, what, what, if you could only have one book, what book would it be? Yeah. It's like, you know, the answer always ends up either being like the Bible, <laughs> Atlas Shrugged, or Mein Kampf. Yeah. You know, like if you could only have one book, you should probably get something else. Yeah. You know? I want to know who's only letting you have one <laughs> book. You've got bigger problems. Yeah. Yeah. If I can only have one book, I probably want no books. Yeah. Because yeah. that way I don't know what I'm missing out or, on. Or, you know, like a giant thesaurus that I can hit the mm. person who's only letting me have and one, one book, book with. with. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks very much, both of you. For... Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, please leave a comment down below, hit that thumbs up button, and be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below. And if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UK page one, as evidenced here, and our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later.